Pharmaceutical Processing in conjunction with Interfex 2018 presents Interfex Live. Welcome to the latest interview in Pharmaceutical Processing series of Interfex Live sessions in advance of Interfex 2018, which takes place on April 17th to the 19th at the Javits Center in New York City. We're fortunate to have as our guest today, Dan Sorgen, Head of U.S. Supply Chain and Distribution Quality at Genentech, Inc. Dan has been in biotech for over 20 years, focusing on various aspects of the industry, from supply chain to IT. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for joining us today. Can you please speak generally about what the cold supply chain is and why it's such an important aspect of the pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, so uh, the, the cold supply chain is the process and its various lengths for getting important cold chain medicines from the manufacturer to the patient. So typically this is defined as 2 to 8 Celsius uh, or also 36 to 46 Fahrenheit. Uh, and cold chain has been around for a while. I mean, we all get groceries like milk, cheese, butter, and my favorite cookie dough, um, as well as the agriculture and floral industry. So cold chain has been around for a while. However, in those industries that the cold chain wasn't intact, the spoiled product only made for a disappointed customer. Uh, in the case of pharmaceutical cold chain, uh, if it's not intact, it can make for ineffective ther therapies at the best or patient harm at the worst. So also a thing to note that the cold chain uh, is, is similar but different than frozen supply chain, which sometimes can be actually an easier target to hit than the small range of two to eight. So uh, I think cold chain is probably the hardest target to hit. Uh, it's different than ambient and it's different than frozen. Those tend to be easier targets to hit than that that small balance window of two to eight Celsius. What are the biggest challenges facing the cold chain process right now? So in, in my opinion, there, there are many challenges and also hence opportunities. Uh, so the, I think the complexity of the cold chain is one of them. So there are many, many handoffs, uh, both within the manufacturer's world as well as downstream. So for example, you might have a manufacturer who makes uh, a drug substance and then sends it to a CMO for packaging and then off to a 3PL for distribution. So there's multiple handoffs all right there before it even hits the market. Uh, and then from there, you can add wholesalers, forward distribution centers, specialty distribution centers, clinics, your hospitals, your pharmacies, et cetera. So you can see how the product can experience many different transitions and therefore thermal risks. Right. Uh, now you also think about the additional data layer uh, if we really care about that. So if that comprehensive thermal exposure is is going to be made available across the spectrum, you know, to, to all the way down to the, the healthcare professional and the patient, you can see that that those data handoffs, not only the product handoffs, but the data handoffs are very challenging, especially since a lot of those IT systems don't integrate right now. Now, thankfully, serialization is starting to, to, to change some of that. Uh, and align and provide for common standards, et cetera, but we're, we're far from there. Are there unique challenges involved when dealing with formulations involving molecular activity? Uh, yeah, so so the analogy I like to, 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 to use goes back to the groceries. And in old school pharma uh, from decades ago was like a grocer dealing with soup cans. They were very robust mechanically. They were very robust thermally. Uh, that's different than today's biopharma grocer, you know, which would be more like someone, a, a, a grocer dealing with eggs, where they're fragile, they're thermally sensitive, and they have a much shorter shelf life. Um, you know, and that makes sense because soups were, soup cans are, you know, like recipes. They're very basic and all that versus eggs came from a living being, just like biologic medicines. What are the biggest contributors to cold chain breaches? That that's hard to say, but anyone handling a cold chain product has the potential to cause uh, a, a cold chain breach. So I'd say the folks that are either uninformed or unaware of what they're handling have a greater potential to negatively impact that product. How common would you say breaches are? Uh, well, we, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, I think independently, uh, each link in the supply chain thinks that the breaches are rare. However, you start to link those links together, uh, I would say that, that that's probably more, more common than we'd like to think and we'd like to admit. Uh, however, when I've walked the supply chain, I found that there are quite a few non-optimal processes occurring out in the wild outside beyond the manufacturer. 
What's needed to properly maintain biosimilars and other temperature sensitive medicines to maintain effectiveness? Okay, good, good question. Um, so first off, Genentech is an innovator of, of medicines, and so the, therefore we don't have any experience with biosimilars. But I think the, the focus on cold chain is extremely important across the board for those. Um, but there are a lot of other things that we need to take into consideration, uh, things like uh, variabilities uh, like vibration, shock, light, uh, and humidity, depending on what type of container closure you're using, whether it's a vial, whether it's a pre-filled syringe, an auto-injector, things like that. How are the products monitored during cold chain transport? So, so product monitoring should depend on the shipping qualification. So it can range, shipping qualification and, and the temperature monitoring can range from electronic temperature monitors dispersed throughout a semi-truck trailer load, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to single temperature chemical sensitive uh, or uh, temperature sensitive chemical go no go indicators uh, that are placed in a small parcel load where the product is. Uh, I think the key would be that the product's requirement, that the requirements are aligned with the many variables that occur during transport. Uh, things like the duration, your payload volumes, uh, where the recipient is located, uh, and your container airflow. Uh, and I, I would say additionally, a quality risk assessment can be very valuable in providing information on where attention should be placed on these activities within the supply chain. Um, some of your cold chain activities could be more susceptible to temperature excursions, uh, such as your international shipments, which tend to have longer durations, uh, shipments to hotter or cold extremes. We always call it here, uh, you know, Minnesota and Arizona, right? Minnesota in the winter, Arizona in the summer. Uh, and then transport exceptions, such as you know, delayed or misrouted packages. Do logistics become significantly more complicated when providing biologics and regenerative therapies in developing countries? Definitely. Uh, ensuring that the, the cold chain supply is only good as good as the reliability of the infrastructure. Uh, here in the U.S., you know, we, we take for granted, you know, the power grid that powers our cold rooms, that runs our refrigerators, that, you know, charges our, our, uh, our containers and even freezes our gel bricks for small parcels. Um, and, and even in most places in the U.S., if that power grid goes down, we've got diesel generator backups to that, that kick in and provide for all that power. Uh, but even in the U.S., there are challenges within the distribution network. So if you think about last year, the challenges that were uh, uh, that Houston and Florida and Puerto Rico encountered during the hurricanes. Um, now you go to developing countries where the power grid is you know, less reliable uh, or only available for certain periods of time. And you can see how that cold chain, chain supply challenge uh, exists. And that's only for storage. That doesn't, that doesn't go into the, some of the longer transit times where the distribution network isn't as robust. Um, one key tool I think that companies can really uh, take advantage of is to physically walk your, your cold supply chain. Uh, that, that's time consuming, I understand, and it's also logistically challenging. However, uh, it's an underperformed activity that can yield extremely beneficial results uh, because it, what it does is it exposes some of the, the revealing, it exposes some of the revealing risks uh, and exposing the unknown. You don't know, again, you don't know what you don't know. Um, it's one thing for an activity to exist in a process map or in a contract, but it's another thing to actually see what your product is going through uh, and what it's exposed to. So those exposures can be thermal, they can be you know, mechanical, uh, they can be security in nature. You might find out you know, things along those kind of lines. Uh, but I think it's, in, in, it's also an important for us to take a look at those, walk that supply chain. Again, it's an underused tool in, from my perspective. Biologics are growing at a time when pharma manufacturers seem to be trying to reduce R&D costs. Are there steps underway to build more efficiencies into the cold chain? So uh, R&D tends to tend to be a, a separate arm from uh, cold chain efficiencies, unless you're talking clinical. But if you're talking commercial in nature for distribution, I think those tend to be more operational costs. And there are a lot of those type of efficiencies that, that are being taken to try and reduce some of those costs while still keeping the quality aspect in it. So uh, things like reusing of uh, small parcel containers or you know shipping in larger volumes, uh, things like that, I, I think are efforts that companies can do to reduce the cost and still keep the quality, but they tend not to be associated with R&D. R&D is, is more on the front end of the investigational medicines. 
Is cybersecurity an issue to make certain that tampering doesn't impact temperature and other controls as product moves through the supply chain? Uh, I, I think that that's definitely something that we, we need to take into consideration because if, um, if, if someone that, that is involved in illegal or gray market activities uh, is handling product, probably one of the last things they're concerned about, because they're already doing something illegal, they're not going to be concerned about keeping the, the product within temperature. So I would almost always assume that if product has been handled by some of those entities, that it auto automatically has experienced temperature excursions that could potentially impact product quality on top of the fact that they might have been adulterated or counterfeited or any of the other illegal activity associated with those ventures. How has the need for cold chain services grown or changed over the past few years? I think it's changed from a, a volume perspective uh, as biologics continue to, to, to uptick and, and we find out more of these medicines and they continue to be distributed to our patients. I think the, the other thing is uh, we're also, as, a, as an industry, experiencing uh, cost pressures. So to, to continually drive down, you know, the, some of the costs where, again, we're not just, you know, taking your styrofoam, you know, igloo container and, and shipping it. Uh, I know that there are advanced uh, thermal perspectives that utilize vacuum technology and all that, but some of that is still very expensive, especially when you're talking about your large volumes that need to get distributed out into the channel. Yeah. Where do you see it heading in the short and long term? Uh, that uh, if I knew that I would uh, actually be able to, to place all my all my money on, on red and then retire and roll the roulette wheel. Um, now I, I think there are going to be a lot of disruptive technologies. Things like uh, like for example, Amazon is already coming into you know uh, in, into play and, and into the pharmaceutical area and arena. I think there there might be pushing more uh, more manufacturing down where it's closer to patients, especially as you get into personalized medicine. Uh, and, and the speed, I think the speed is going to change, that cycle time is going to continue to decrease. And so I think those will uh, bode well for cold chain. If, if you're talking shorter cycle times, cold chain, I think, will benefit from that because it will provide for less opportunities for material to be out in outside of its thermal nature. But it, I think it will also be more challenging as, as time goes on as well. It will be interesting, that's for sure. Lastly, what recommendations do you have for those in the industry? Um, I think companies re really should get out there and understand their supply chains. I think they, they know them from a, from a high level perspective, but to get out there and actually walk the supply chains, that's some of the things that I've seen, and we're, we're a very mature company, but some of the things I've seen uh, out in the wild uh, have, have been very interesting and, and still cause uh, you know, cause perplexion, so to speak. Thanks, Dan. We want to thank Dan Sorgen, the head of U.S. Supply Chain and Distribution Quality at Genentech, Inc., for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about Genentech, company representatives will be at Interfex 2018 on April 17th through the 19th at the Java Center in New York. Thank you for joining us today in preparation for the pharmaceutical industry's premier annual event. Pharmaceutical Processing in conjunction with Interfex 2018 presents Interfex Live.